Well, all right, Bruce and Tony Hebel, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jonathan. Glad, glad to be here. Glad to be here. Yes, it's so good to see y'all. I, I'm, I'm glad we get to, uh, for those who are listening to this, you're only hearing it the first time. We've actually tried to record this before and had, uh, let's just say, beyond major technical difficulties. So I'm glad that we can see each other, hear each other, and uh, get into this really important conversation around forgiveness. I mean, that's really what your whole ministry is about, is is uh, this topic of forgiveness. So first, before we get to uh, the book that you've written on forgiving forward and learning more about your ministry, uh, why don't you tell us how you personally got to where you are now in terms of doing the kind of work that you're doing? Well, we didn't plan on doing what we're doing. This was not on our bucket list. Go out and teach people about forgiveness. Yeah. I, I was raised in a pastor's home and I was nine when I knew I was going into going into ministry. Uh, and uh, I watched my dad and, and he got hurt a lot. And uh, I said, I'm not making the same mistakes he did. So I go to you know, Bible college, we meet, get married, go to seminary, get trained, and we go into our ministry. And uh, first, right off the bat, we get wounded. Uh, and it happened in multiple places over many years. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I think you, I call focus darkest, on the, moments, yeah. darkest moments you called. I called Focus on the Family Pastoral Hotline because I was falling apart and I was in a very dark place. And the, the counselor for Focus on the Family on the other side asked me this question. He said, why are you still doing this? Why are you still doing ministry? Most people would have quit by now because we never quit. We just kept pushing through, kept pushing through. And because um, we knew it was our calling and we we were working as unto the Lord, not unto ourselves. And so anyhow, he was he proceeded to tell me that that's the worst story. The situations, the things we've been through was the worst story he had ever heard in his time there at Focus on the Family. Yeah, so, so, we, were so we didn't quit. We kept going and uh, we'd come into a new situation and it was kind of a dysfunctional and my leadership gifts and my teaching gifts uh, God was using and the church was getting better and it, things was growing and, and, and we're getting direction. And uh, But inside my heart, I was a mess because the scab from an old wound got knocked off by a current event, which is probably not, not happened to anybody listening besides us. But <laughs> uh, and I didn't tell anybody. Uh, I didn't tell Tony. I didn't tell my best friend. I didn't tell anyone because I'm a pastor, right? We're pastors. We're supposed to fix problems, not have problems. So often, foolishly, we pastors will stuff stuff. And uh, finally, at the end of, I'm at the end of my rope, and uh, end up meeting with a counselor, and a counselor challenges me, uh, and so I get away with just me and God, and uh, God revealed that there was a a guy that I thought I'd forgiven. In fact, I'd written him a letter and told him I'd forgiven him. And God said, I read your letter. You didn't forgive him. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, in that special moment with God, uh, I chose to forgive that man for the specific things that he had done that wounded me and my family and everything in my account, everything in my spirit shifted, everything changed. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm free. I'm go home, share it with Tony. She gets free. She forgives brought our kids together. They're in their late teens, early twenties. And, uh, they'd been wounded a lot because pastor's kids get hurt a lot. And 11 hours, wasn't it? Right. We had 11 hours with our family. We, our family dealt with old stuff and it just changed us. And so, uh, through a series of just interesting, very clear God, uh, uh, moments, uh, we left the Little C Church and went to the Big C Church, and we've launched into Forgiving Forward. Our passion is to help people experience the freedom of the gospel through the power of forgiveness. So that's a thumbnail of what we how <laughs> yes. we got here. Yeah, and we'll probably be unpacking some of that as we get into some more of the specifics of just what you do now in your ministry around this topic of forgiveness. But first, just for the sake of uh, definitions, because I think you know people hear a term like forgiveness. And there may be all kinds of different ways in mm-hmm. which people are defining that, interpreting that, maybe even experiencing or not experiencing it in their life. So when you guys speak of forgiveness, can you unpack what that means in terms of just defining the term? Yeah, bottom line, forgiveness is applying the blood of Jesus as payment in full for every wound I ever have or will suffer. It's applying the blood of Jesus as payment in full for every wound I ever have or will suffer. And when we forgive, most people will never say anything negative about forgiveness. They'll agree, yes, it's important. We need to do that. 
But what we have discovered is a lot of people just salute forgiveness. They think it in their mind. Yeah, okay, I forgive them. But they don't actually do it. So we point out what we call the protocols of forgiveness, which we may go over later. But right now, I just want to point out that there is an action involved. There is something we do, and it's not between it's us. It's a choice. It's a decision. Right. A transaction. And a transaction, yes. And we don't, it has nothing to do with us going to the person who's wounded us. This is all between us and God. And we show clearly from scripture all of these pieces about forgiveness. We have discovered that forgiveness um, does not say what happened to me is okay you know, the wound I suffered that it, it oh, it's no big deal. No, it was such a big deal that Jesus died for it. It's, it is not okay. What we do say though, is that it was covered. It was already paid for. So when we don't forgive, we're saying the blood of Jesus isn't enough to cover what they did that hurt me. Yeah. So, um, clearly in your definition, uh, obviously the root of forgiveness is in God through Christ. Yes, correct. So talk a little bit about that and why that's so important, because it sounds to me like, you know, I think some people think of forgiveness a lot of times in terms of like, I forgive you mm. as if like the original root point of forgiveness comes from within me. Mm. But clearly in your definition, you're saying, no, actually the roots of forgiveness are in God through Christ. So can you talk about why that is so essential and maybe question. how that can even reframe how a person thinks about That's forgiveness? A great question. Yeah, because in the in the construct you just shared, what I forgive basically means that you've wounded me, you you incurred a debt against me. You there's a, there's a there's a loss that I've suffered because of what you've done, and I'm no longer going to make you pay for it. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to cover it. I'm so gonna I, it. I'm going to carry the note, and you you get off free. Anytime we do that, we walk away somewhat resentful. I mean, it's just not fair that, that not only would they do it, but I've got to carry yeah. the note. And Where's we the say, in that? yeah, we say that the, the blood of Jesus paid for it. it the, the, I think only through the gospel, only through the cross is the issue of payment resolved. In every other construct, Somebody else has got to pay for what they did, or I have to cover what someone did to me. Here we're saying somebody else paid for it. Jesus paid for it, a bigger entity than us. And so we're receiving that payment as payment in full for what they did. Without the cross, there's no settlement of the of, of the debt satisfactorily. Right. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I think... Um, Everything in the world is is somehow uh, borrowed from God, right? So there's right. all these 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 worldly ways of thinking about certain things, like well, they have to borrow from God. And the whole idea of atonement, what you just said about like I've got to carry the debt now, well, that's actually borrowing from God in a sense. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't work because um, if I'm now carrying your debt. In other words, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to carry that on my shoulder. And help me if I'm understanding this correctly. Mm -hmm. If I'm carrying this on my shoulders, well, then where is the relief for me? Absolutely. Right, right. So first, John. Hence, hence the resentment, right? There's a resentment there mm -hmm. that if I forgive, that's why forgiveness feels like it's people walk away feeling this just isn't fair. Well, it's not. Uh, yeah, First John 2, 2 was the key verse for me when we discovered it that says that Jesus is the satisfaction, full payment for not only my sins, but also the sins of the entire world. So he paid for it. Yeah, yeah. He He's the only one who can actually cover that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Debt. Well, before we get into kind of unpacking, okay, what does this look like in real time, in real life? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about where what the roots are for unforgiveness? Mm -hmm. Like, where does that, that come is, from? Yeah. Well, uh, bottom line, pride, right? You know, it's it's about me, and it's and I think the other issue, it's ingratitude. Uh, in fact. I think the most shocking statement Jesus makes in all the scriptures is found in Matthew 18, and it deals with forgiveness. When uh, Peter says, how many times do I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Is seven times enough? Well, you know, Peter knew that the Pharisees said twice you had to, three times if you want to be generous. After that, you don't. He was looking for a pat on the back, right? And Jesus said 490 times, which is an unlimited number. 
Because <laughs> if you get to the 460s and you're still counting, you probably have not been forgiving. So, and then Jesus gives us a parable. Uh, and it's a story of a wealthy man, ruler, who came to collect debts from servants who owed him money. And the first one owed him 10,000 talents. And he said, pay me what you owe me. I don't have it. I'm going to throw you in debtor's prison. Please, please, please give me time. I'll pay it back. Didn't ask for forgiveness, asked for time. And the ruler forgave him the debt. Well, that debt, a talent was worth 15 years wages. So 10,000 talents is 150,000 years worth of wages, Lots. which is an insurmountable debt. That's $7.5 billion at 50 grand a year. And he forgave the debt. Following that, Instead of being in a good mood and being generous to others, that same servant found a fellow servant on line with him under the same ruler's authority who owed him 100 days wages. And same appeal, please give me time. I'll pay it back. Possible. 10,000 talents, not possible. And he choked him and threw him in prison. And the ruler summoned him. He said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you asked for mercy. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow servant the same way I had mercy on you? Same Which way. is a legitimate question. So in that concert, it's, it's a lack of gratitude for what I've been forgiven and unwillingness to, 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 to push it forward. Uh, and in that concert, in that story, Jesus says the ruler handed him over to the torturers until he should repay what he owed. What did he owe? He didn't know the money. He owed forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. Jesus said, my father's going to do the same to you if each of you doesn't forgive your brother from your heart. So our unforgiveness is a lack of gratitude for what we've been forgiven. And so when we don't give it, God disciplines us with torment. Yeah. So let's, uh, I know that by this time, our listeners are going, okay, okay, okay. I, I, I kind of understand your definition. I understand at least the concept. Um, but let's talk about where it really, you know, where the rubber meets the road, where this gets really challenging and all the various dynamics of relationships and everything that can go wrong in relationships where there is offenses flying in all directions and there's wounds that have been occur incurred. There's been abuses that have happened. Let's talk about what this means in like real life. Um, what does this process look like? How do we forgive? Wow. Great question. Well, a uh, couple of things is uh, even in the relational issues, we find the relational conflict, when, particularly with couples who come to see us. Actually, we've done analytics on this 100% of all couples that we meet with that are struggling in their marriage, have lots of conflict in their marriage. The wound that is causing the torment which is exhibiting itself in the um, situation, in the, yeah, anxiety, the conflict, depression, but, no, the conflict in the marriage. Yeah, yeah. But that wound that is causing the torment that's exhibiting itself in the conflict in the marriage predate the couple ever meeting 100% of the time. And so... So oftentimes dealing with the, the, the surface wounds, while you have to do that, mm -hmm. doesn't resolve the issues. You got to go to the root issues. Like what? Who's the first person that talked to me that way? Who's the first person that... Um, was absent in my life? Who's the first person that didn't keep his promises or her promises or whatever it is, whatever the issue is, ask the question, who's the first person? And we, it's incredible how God reveals that. And so then we take these people, because we do a lot of coaching, what we call forgiveness coaching um, in person on Zoom. We have a center here in the Atlanta area and we coach people to freedom by forgiving the wounds that even predate their the meeting with the with the family. The yeah, and, and Jonathan, I know you asked how, but before you get to the how, you got to get to the who, right? Who? What? And, and again, we're not forgiving. I said again. I've said that another time. It's not in this meeting, but we don't <laughs> forgive people as much as we forgive wounds. What right? they did, and it's those wounds. Well, we got to identify the wounds. But once we do that, how do you forgive? It's very simple. You're applying the blood of Jesus as payment in full. So our first protocol. So we have five main protocols for, for forgiveness on the how to. Is yeah. thanking God for forgiving you. So we're getting back into that place of gratitude that we all talked right. about earlier. So you're moving away from all of being about me or whatever. Realize I've been forgiven more from God mm -hmm. than this person has done to me. I, I've, I've offended God. I've wounded God. I've, I've violated God more than anyone else has violated me. So that gets you into a attitude of gratitude. Right. 
Now let's let's actually I want to unpack that a little bit more because I can already hear you know we've got a whole um, we've got a whole wives care ministry. Wonderful. And our whole wives care ministry is dealing with women who have experienced betrayal trauma because of sexual infidelities of many different kinds. And I can almost hear them screaming at the mm-hmm. podcast right now and saying, I have never done what my husband has done to me. And so sometimes help us understand how to gain that perspective that is saying, God has forgiven me more than what this person could ever do to me. Because I can already hear people saying, there's an imbalance there because I've never cheated on my husband. I've never done these things. So help us understand what you mean by getting to that first protocol of mm-hmm. like gratitude about the forgiveness that they've received. Well, there, there's, in all due respect, there's a little bit of arrogance in that con- in that statement, right? Because if I'm comparing God's holiness and my holiness and my husband's holy unholiness and my unholiness, uh, if I'm his to mine, maybe I'm better, but mine to God, what God has done, it, there's no contrast. I mean, I have violated and sinned against God way more than anyone else has done against me, and particularly even those who husbands committed adultery or whatever you say, you know, that, that, that's, that's terrible. But Jesus said in Matthew six, that if you say, I hate you, you've committed murder. So we've all violated God and sinned against God dramatically. And God left heaven in his perfect, uh, in his perfection and came to pay for our sins. So we realize we don't deserve mercy. We don't deserve grace. We didn't deserve Jesus. I think we need to back up too, because we didn't really touch on torment. So in the Greek, the word torment from Matthew 18 is used 18 times. That's, in, that's interesting. 18, 18, just caught that. 18 times in the Greek New Testament after all these are you, years. Are you back? I'm back. Okay. Um, so, um, and every time it's used, it's referring to Satan, hell, demons, that sort of thing. We see tormented exhibited in depression, anxiety, fear. I mean, gripping fear, not just fear of a snake or something. Um, panic attacks. We see it in paranoia, in um, some physical issues. We've actually seen pe- people physically healed after they forgave. We see it in all, all of the addictions, whether it's sexual addictions, alcohol, drugs, even some food addictions. And so when people are gripped with these things, they are under discipline. God does not punish us. No. But when we're not forgiving, we're not representing him well, because that's what he's all about. That's what he's all about. So he wants us to line up with his way of thinking and forgive like he forgave. And so um, and walk in forgiveness and pre-forgiveness. It's just the what should ooze out of our pores is is forgiveness. So when we don't forgive, we're under discipline and it shows itself in that way. It's literally a tormentor. It's literally we believe it's literally a demonic being that is influencing us and tormenting us. Because we have seen literally thousands of people, when they forgive, the torment leaves, myself included. When I forgave, I was didn't want to live anymore. I'll just put it that way. And um, when I forgave, the torment left in, absolutely instantly, and, and I was completely set free from depression. Um, and I think, well, let me add in here, yeah. I think to, to, to go back to your question about, hey, I've not done as bad as him. The other question I would ask in that, so besides the blood of Jesus, what do you need him to do that would satisfy you? If the blood of Jesus isn't enough for you, exactly what would be? Mm -hmm. And I think we we have dozens and dozens, hundreds of stories, actually, Mm -hmm. of couples in that scenario where forgiveness is extended and and, and freedom walks out in one setting. Right. Uh, Brad and Lisa. Yeah, so we had a couple come to us. He had a 25-hour-a-week um, pornography habit. He had his own business, and he could afford it, and he that's what he did. And when we drilled down on some In of multiple the, affairs. Yeah, multiple affairs. That's right. He had an affair with his best friend's wife and his wife's best friend, as well as prostitutes. It was full-blown out sexual addiction. When they came to us, it God revealed the deep wound in his life where his sister had molested him frequently and then gave her, him to her friends to do the same thing. And they used him as a sex toy. When he forgave his sister, 
everything changed in him. He was a different person, like literally. His wife, the same thing. She had experienced very similar things in her, with her father. She forgave her father. She forgave her husband. They were weeping. They were embraced. He forgave himself. Oh, it was unbelievable. And and when they were comp- when they were finished, they were already had a. I mean, they were completely separated. When they were finished, they were reconciled. We have seen them since then. That was many years ago. We've seen them multiple times through the years, even one not too long ago, and they are still doing absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it was a dozen years because ago. the tormentor's not there anymore. Jesus says, "Is when you forgive from your heart, I will remove the tormentor." It's kind of black and white like that, and that's what we see all the time. Now, what about, uh, so I know we want to get to these five, the rest of the five protocols, but even that first one, um, I can imagine there could be some challenges to getting there, not intellectually, but emotionally. And I think the reason is, is because it seems to me like it could be difficult for somebody who has faced, let's say, serious betrayal Mm -hmm. to feel like I want to, I want to feel a sense in which justice is done. Right. And I know that theologically we can go absolutely blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. How do you help that to connect to someone emotionally who is really working through that? And maybe that's where some of the other protocols come in. But to be able to say, hey, I understand or I understand on a certain level. God has forgiven me. I recognize that. Um, Boy, how does that flow through me when I'm wanting when really what I want here is justice, not necessarily mercy? Yeah. And we hear that a lot. What, you know, uh, no justice, no peace. We hear that in the culture a lot, right? If I get unless I get justice, I'm not at peace. The problem with that concept is that no one who ever gets the justice they demand ever finds peace. So you're 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 not going to get what you want for because peace doesn't come from justice. Peace comes from the injustice of the cross, where the just died for the unjust, so the unjust could be made just. And it and we really move through the Matthew 18 story pretty quickly here. So I would encourage people to go back. Maybe you go to our website. There's a sermon I teach. It's about 35 minutes. Watch that so you can break it down and you understand this torment piece. And when we when we realize from our heart that Jesus paid for what they did and to not forgive it is to dishonor the blood of Jesus and to dishonor what he did for us. That actually changes our perspective. This this actual protocol of forgive of uh, gratitude number one is really what changes our heart and our perspective. Yeah, we'll, it we'll lines also, us up with God. We also will read to them Hebrews ten, where it says that when we don't forgive, it's like we're stomping on the blood of Jesus. I think it's ten twenty seven, I believe. But what really what it comes down to when we're meeting with people, whether it's in person or on Zoom, um, is we we're not trying to persuade anybody to do anything. That's not our job. The Holy Spirit is the one that is in control of that. And when people are hurting and we show them from scripture how the reason you can't get over this addiction or the reason you don't want to get out of bed in the morning is because of the unforgiveness you carry, they want freedom from that. And when they see where it's, the root is, where the, why they feel this way, why they're struggling, why their relationships aren't working, then most people are willing to move into and forgive. And so and God, the Holy Spirit will will enlighten their heart and show them just how fu- foolish it is for them to think that they're better, that they can't be thankful for what God did for them. And so we don't real in our coachings, we really don't have a whole lot of issue. People, most of the people just will walk right into that being grateful part piece. And when we do that in faith, even if we're not feeling it, um, God just honors faith that we're gonna we're gonna walk in faith in this and just opens our heart. And I, and I think that actually leads us into protocol number two, because this is where we're dealing with our heart, the heart of gratitude. But our heart gets open mm-hmm. with protocol number yeah. two when we repent of our sin of unforgiveness, recognizing that our unforgiveness is disciplined more harshly than what anything else. It, God disciplines mm-hmm. A spouse's unforgiveness more harshly than he deals with the sp- the other spouse's infidelity. It's that sounds kind of crazy to people, mm-hmm. but the dishonor, the blood of Jesus, to trample under foot the shed blood of Jesus is a big deal to God. So when we repent of our sin of unforgiveness, 
that we've dishonored the blood of Jesus and we don't want to do that anymore. We're, we are wrong to dishonor the blood by not forgiving. That shifts everything and it opens up our pipe, in a sense, our, our access to the Holy Spirit to get into our heart and open our heart. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that, um, and I can already tell just even in, in these first two protocols that you all have, that there's a major shift in the focus of the person that is doing the forgiving. Correct. Because the the very first one is saying, I got to put my eyes up. I got to put them on Jesus and recognize that I have been forgiven. I've then got to move to a place of saying, oh, guess what? I've got to deal with my own heart in terms of holding on to unforgive. So it's almost as if not to say that the, the, the person that has violated you disappears, but in some ways it seems like you're getting a whole different like focus in the frame of what you're actually trying to uh, pay attention to. Yeah, it, yeah it's that's a exactly good way to say it. because we're no longer the issue. Jesus is because if I'm making him the issue, then I'm the issue. It's this guy, his relationship. What he's done to me is the issue. But when I shift to what God has done for me and what me un, not forgiving him does and says about the cross, it lines it up, and it's now between me and God. I think it's important to insert here. Yeah. That now in a marriage situation, it's a different, a little bit of a different story because you're one and all that. But unless God specifically tells you to, when you forgive someone, we say, don't go tell them. Right. Because if they don't have not repented, they'll, then they'll reject your forgiveness. It's another wound you have to forgive. So your job is to come to the table of reconciliation with the father, son, and spirit sitting there and forgive and let God deal with the reconciliation piece with that other party. We do all and of let this. God communicate it. Let God deal with that. Yeah. We do all of this in prayer between us and God. Um, as we're helping people, of course, um, out loud. I mean, this is just the, the, the nuts and bolts of how we do this. And when their words are spoken, they're just powerful. Last week, in fact, last week we had a lady so the, the way you put that, Jonathan, was interesting because last week we had a lady that went through, I mean, she had so many wounds and she forgave all of this. And her husband was sitting next to her and she had wounded him really bad. She was the, the main issue in the marriage. Um, and he was holding her hand and was lovingly, you know, helping her with her. And when she finished, she opened her eyes and she said, OK, I know you all were in the room. I know my husband was holding my hand. I was aware of that. But this is really weird. I, and she's never had anything like this before. And she's a doer. So she's not even a, a thinker or a heart person. She's a doer. She says, I don't, I felt like I wasn't in the room. I felt like God and I were somewhere else. And I can't even make sense of this. But it was just like the two of us were together. And he was there walking me through all this. And I was making things right with him. And we saw her days later, a week later. No, just a few days it was, later. We was just it, ran and into we her. ran into her, just ran into her. And she, she's just a different person. But yeah, it is. It's a, it's a special, intimate moment between us and God when we're forgiving. And he's right there and is cheering us on when we and do. And when we repent, it really lines us back it up. opens with our him. heart. Yeah. yeah. So then so what that, comes next after repentance? Well, you ask God, who do I forgive and for what? This is number three. Now, because again, we're, we're, we're forgiving wounds, not people, but the wounds are always associated with a person. And as Tony said earlier, we find, particularly in a relationship, the wound that's most causing of the most of the wound that's causing the torment that's driving the conflict, the relationship predate the couple knowing each other. Mm -hmm. So there are always root wounds. Mm -hmm. The surface wounds are just bumping the root wounds, right? And so how do we get to, we ask the Holy Spirit and it's his job to tell us these things. He's good at his job. Holy Spirit, who do I forgive and for what? Now this sounds crazy because you probably think, oh, people know who, who wounded me. I don't have a problem with, but we have found that what who they think it is and who God brings to their mind is totally different on many occasions that many times, um, well, we'll ask the question or we'll say, just ask God, well, let's just ask him, who do you need to forgive? Where's the root and for what? And let's just give it some silence and we wait. And then after the silence, I'll ask the question. I'll say, so who's the first person that came to your mind or your heart or the first name that came to your first mind? First face you see. First face you see. And they'll say my science teacher or something. I mean, you know, some crazy out of left field and we're like, what? And, and I say, okay, we're going to believe the Holy Spirit brought that person to you for a reason. Let's walk through and forgive the, that person for all the things that the Holy Spirit brings up in, in your mind. Um, any scenario, any words that were spoken, any wounds that were intentional or unintentional, um, what you hoped for that didn't happen. 
you know, we'll go through a messages I received for yeah. things they didn't, they, they said that they shouldn't have said things that they should have said that they didn't say, uh, affirmations how they made me get, feel right. All these things. We'll go through all of that. And wow, it's, we just always and, are amazed. Even though we've done it so many times, we're amazed when they say, I haven't thought about that yeah. situation in years. Which has led it. We were kind of, we've kind of drifted into yeah. so number four. protocol number four, which is the forgiveness protocol, the actual forgiveness protocol. protocol. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, Forgive each offense from your heart, from from the from the core of who you are, from the your soul. In a sense, you, you, it's like pulling arrows out of these wounds. So, from my heart, stay with one person at a time. I forgive my dad for never showing up at my ball games, for telling me I'd never be good enough, for not telling me he's proud of me, for cheating on my mom, for deserting the family. Or I forgive my mom for making me feel like I would never be good enough. The Stay with dad till you're done with dad. Stay with whoever it is. You forgive specific things they did or did not do, mm-hmm. said or did not say, uh, in ways that they they made you feel they or the message you yeah you received. So we use the words because they come from Matthew 18. From my heart, I choose. It's not a feeling. It's a choice to forgive this person for these things. And when the memories stop stop coming to you, nothing else is there. Then we'll ask, Holy Spirit, is there anything else? Is there anything we've missed? And if nothing's there, then we say these words. I declare, I'm going to use dad, for instance. I declare my dad is no longer in my debt because I transfer all of his sin or all of his debt to the cross where Jesus paid it all. We make a declaration. Notice there's a transactional aspect. It's it's transactional. I'm taking a debt. I'm applying the blood of Jesus to it. I'm transferring the debt to the cross. It is a transaction. It's not a process. It's not an emotion. We're Although emotions are a part of it, it may be a process mm-hmm. leading us to it. But it's actually a choice to make. It's we don't we don't let someone say, "Lord, I want to forgive." We say, "Now nah, I want a Mercedes. I chose a Toyota." Right. Mm-hmm. So well, I'm making a choice. So it's transactional. Mm-hmm. Now, what? Um, so I can imagine that even in those that kind of third and fourth protocol there that there can be some some hiccups that there can be some things where where people go okay maybe i'm maybe i'm not quite there yet from my heart what do you do in terms of maybe is there is there like a pause button is there a way to say hey we you know because like you said you can't force somebody to take that step even though they might cognitively know this is a choice Mm-hmm. But their heart may still be saying, I'm I'm still preferring to hold on. I mean, like, how do you help sort of navigate that with somebody? Because you can't that, you can't force another person's heart right, right. to be where you would hope it would be. Right. Yeah, but I think when you get through protocol number one and two, mm-hmm. the heart's ready. When people, I mean, one of the questions if people are challenging, I say, Are you enjoying your torment? Do you want to be free of torment? It's their choice. It's your choice. Do you want to be free of torment? So in faith, choose to declare from my heart, I'm going to do this. And the emotion will follow. It's interesting how we will take people through. They'll start and it'll be pretty heady. I forgive my dad for leaving my mom. I forgive my mom. You know, And then all of a sudden, you'll there'll be like a button that switches on and they'll start to weep. They'll start to cry. And I forgive my dad for embarrassing me in front of my friends when I, and I couldn't bring them home because he was an alcoholic. And, 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 and it, so they have to kind of start. And then once they get going, there'll be a shift. If there's a resentment, if there's one party, if, there, if there's a couple and one is resentful and is very angry, and usually you can tell this if they're sitting far away from the spouse and their arms are crossed like this and, and um, they have that look on their face. And we will, sometimes we've had to ask people this kind of a crazy thing. It's just, but anyhow, we ask them to open their hands. I know this this sort of doesn't make sense, but when they open their hands, their, their heart is, has a better chance of opening when they're like this and they're crossed arms and they're clenched fits, then they will, it won't open. So we ask, sometimes we'll ask people to open their hands, but most of the time, the people we meet with. Um, or that contact us, our contact is because they're in a lot of pain and they want to be free. And we, we are not smart enough to come up with this. Many of the stories we hear, we've experienced. Now, we have not had a, any um, infidelity in our marriage. Well, no, here, many of the stories we're sharing 
we have watched people do. But I mean, what well, we've experienced a lot of these wounds that we're talking right. about a lot. I mean, we have murder, we've had molestation, we've had a lot of stuff in our in our lives. So lots of betrayal, lots of rejection. So we're not saying this from some kind of um, spiritual, you know, pulpit or whatever. We're, we're saying this, 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 preacher is come, talk. this is not preacher. It has come from our lives so we can identify and we weep with those who weep when we're meeting with them. And we and suffered so, the consequences. Yes. We're here to say, don't unforgive. Torment. Don't not forgive. And yeah. we just say, if you want to be free, this is where it comes from. There's no other way to get free mm-hmm. except to do this. So if you want to be free, in faith, step out. And it is amazing. And oftentimes, oh, I think amazing. Tony was talking about there's a quiet time and we'll say, Holy Spirit, is there anything else? That's oftentimes when the root happened. And so it, now, so then what's the final? Yeah, so number protocol. five. Yeah, number five. There's actually seven, but we're talking about five. The first five is actually the protocol. The main the, protocol. The six and seven is how to deal with memories and how to deal future. with future wounds. Mm-hmm. But the protocol number five, and this is this is the validation Protocol. This is how you people say, how do I know I've forgiven? Ask God to bless them and look for ways to bless them when possible. If you cannot bless someone, you've not forgiven them. Unforgiveness says they must pay. But it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. While we were still enemies, God blessed us with the greatest blessing of all, the death of his son. So I no longer want them to pay. I want them to be blessed. Because, and, and when we choose to, you know, uh, we, it's, it's in bless them in the way in which they wounded you. So we'll add, you know, like we had um, somebody recently whose husband left her and married somebody else and she was still torn up about it. So when she got to this point of forgiving him and she truly forgave him, she was able to say, God, would you please bless my ex-husband? by giving him a marriage that is beautiful, that is nothing like what we have, but solid. The kind of marriage you wanted us to have. Yeah, I mean, it's something along that line. So we're we're asking God to bless them. God, would you give them this, whatever it is they need? It's not, God, would you make them pay? God, would you, uh, you know, help them to learn they need to do that? No, it's true. (laughs) Compassion and mercy will flow. When you forgive, it'll, it's nothing we conjure up. It just flows out of our heart to uh, extend to someone else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you when when you truly forgive, you're going to want good. You know, what's interesting is a lot of people ask us, well, how do I relate to the person? And we didn't really Afterwards. get it. We didn't really get into the reconciliation yeah. piece yet. Or uh, if we may not have time, but right. uh, how do I relate to the person? And I always say, wait, we'll talk about that after we forgive. Ask me if I forget to bring it up. And I never bring it up and neither today because everything shifts. Their attitude moves mm-hmm. from anger toward them to sympathy or empathy toward them. It right. just automatically, the spirit shifts. It. And then the freedom happens. And we, it's just incredible. How, we we ask, how's your heart? And we Mills, get things all like, kinds of things. Yeah. Like, my heart's free. It's light. Mm-hmm. I can breathe again. I'm not carrying them on my back anymore. Um, all the, the addictions stop. We've seen, we've seen. Oh, God, I mean, addictions just stop. We've seen people who are living a lifestyle contrary to God's way, maybe in the um, LGBTQ area, completely turn and go back to living uh, a lifestyle as he want, as he calls them to. Um, depression lifted, yeah, just all the things. It's just incredible. So, so this is this is really uh, encouraging. I know that it's going to be, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this many times in your ministry. There's a there's a it can be challenging for people to really kind of wrap their heads and their arms mm-hmm. and certainly their hearts yeah. around this, because I think the enemy works overtime to make sure we stay divided and in chaos and in torment. He enjoys uh, tormenting us. Yes, he does. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, as we, as we wrap up here, I, I want you to just, if you can maybe speak a word of hope to those who feel either stuck or scared mm-hmm. about maybe going here because they felt a sense of like comfort and maybe holding on to certain things of unforgiveness. Can you speak to them a word of hope and encouragement and then share where people can get your book and resources? Yeah, I, I I would probably just say, is that working for you? Right. It's not working for you. So why don't you try something different? And, uh, and if you're, if you're tired of your torment, the only way out is through forgiveness. And I also, we've also found that most people who need to forgive need help doing it. So uh, we have a coaching center where we coach. We're training other coaches. 
uh, and get someone to help you. Get you can actually download the protocols. It's called the guide on our forg- our website forgivingforward.com. Scroll down, say get the guide. Those are the seven protocols. Uh, and then there's a message that you can watch on the homepage. There's a course you can take. Uh, it's, it's the, called the course. It's called the course. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's if you have Right Now Media, it's actually on Right Now Media, uh, and you, it's called Forgiving Forward: The Freedom of the Gospel. Uh, I, I would just encourage you that your freedom is at the end of your forgiveness. Yeah. And uh, there's there's no reason to live in torment anymore. It does you no good. It does your kids no good. Your family, your sisters, your brothers, your friends, and um, because wounded people. Yeah wound people often in the way in which they're wounded. So if you don't forgive the wound you've done, you're going to most likely inflict that same wound on someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Our, God doesn't let us get free by dishonoring the cross. So once we choose to say, yeah, the blood's enough for me. And if the blood isn't enough for you, we ask what would be, it is enough. So simply apply the blood of Jesus as payment in full. It's enough. Yeah. Uh, so forgivingforward.com. We'd love to help you. Uh, we can't coach everyone, but we have other people we've trained to coach and we're training more coaches. And uh, our, our passion, our vision is to see the body of Christ worldwide experience the freedom of the gospel through the power of forgiveness. And we want to train other coaches and pastors to coach other people as well. And once you get free, we would love for you to join us. We're always looking for more people to help. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, Bruce and Tony, thank you so much for being with us and just for doing the work that you're doing. You're welcome. We love it. We wake up every morning. Really, God, we're the ones you let do this. We're just, we're awed that we get to do this. Well, and listeners, we're glad that you've been with us. We're going to put those uh, links and everything in the show notes. I encourage you to go get a copy of the book that they've written for Giving Forward. And, um, And we want to help you take your next best step on your journey towards wholeness in Christ. So, Uh, Thanks for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care. 